Okay, this video is on the interpretations of quantum physics, which I've been down a little bit of a rabbit hole over the last couple of months, if I'm honest, because the interpretations of quantum physics aren't easy to understand. And I thought, hey, I'll do a video on those, that'll be fun. <laughs> and then I did my research and looked into it and then kind of my brain melted. So anyway, this is my best effort at the interpretations of quantum physics. I hope you enjoy. So what are they? Well, first of all, there's a hole in the bottom of physics when you're at, down at the level of atoms and subatomic particles, you're in the realm of quantum physics. And there's some things in quantum physics that simply just don't make sense. Physicists don't like things not making sense, and so the interpretations of quantum physics are an, an attempt by many different physicists to come up with ways of making quantum physics make sense. Now, if you're not familiar with uh, the terminology of quantum physics, I recommend you watch my last video because it's kind of an introduction to quantum physics, and this video is a sort of part two to that. So, interpretation number one is the Copenhagen interpretation. And that's kind of the standard way we're taught quantum physics when we learn it in university. And it's also kind of the place where I can illustrate where some of the problems start happening. So, in the Copenhagen interpretation, the standard description is, is that subatomic particles, like an electron, is described by a wave function. And this wave function obeys the Schrodinger equation, which tells us how that wave sort of smoothly evolves over time. And features of this wave gives us all of the properties of quantum physics that people talk about, like superposition, entanglement, energy quantization, decoherence, quantum tunneling. All of those things are phenomena that appear because of the wave-like nature of subatomic particles. So the conceptual problems begin when we do a measurement on these waves. So the Copenhagen picture of quantum physics is you have a wave function moving along smoothly according to the Schrodinger equation until it hits an object like a detector. And then what we see, what we measure as a human, is a single particle in a specific position which means that the wave function, which is like spread out over space, when it hits the detector, it suddenly collapses. It's called localization. So the wave localizes from a spread out wave to a very sharply defined wave where, where we see the particle. The trouble is there's, there's no actual physics in quantum mechanics that describes how that collapse happens. And this is known as the measurement problem. So this measurement is sort of a, a barrier which shields the quantum realm. We can never see those wave functions, all we can ever see are particles. And in the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, what they say is like, we, us humans will never see those waves. There's nothing we can do to access that realm. So don't worry wondering whether they're real or not real. The important thing are the measurements. Reality is in the observations which is why it's been termed the shut up and calculate interpretation of quantum physics. But people have not stopped there. They don't like this discontinuous collapse of the wave functions. They've come up with other ways of trying to interpret what's going on. And this brings us to the second interpretation I'm going to cover, the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics. So the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics takes the wave function to be physically real and says, if the Schrodinger equation is just a description of reality, what does reality look like? So what it says is that when you do a measurement on a particle that's in a superposition of many different places at once, actually that particle turns up at all of those different places, just in different versions of reality. Another way to think of it is if a particle is in a superposition of two places at once and it hits a detector, it now puts that detector in a superposition of measuring the particle in one place or another. And if you look at the results from that detector, then it puts you in a superposition of seeing the particle in one place or seeing the particle in another place. But because the results of one place or another are mutually exclusive, it means that now your universe between the two U's have decohered from each other and now split into separate branches. So 
A superposition is described by a wave function, so really there's just one giant mega wave function that describes all of the possibilities that could ever have happened in the entire history of the universe. So if there's an interpretation of quantum physics that you've heard about, it'll be this one, the many worlds interpretation, because it seems to capture public consciousness. <laughs> and I think it's because people like the idea that if you've made like a really bad decision that you regret in the past, you can kind of take comfort in the belief that there's another universe out there where you made a better decision. And so there's a version of you who's happy right now. It also seems to be a very useful storytelling technique in films that want to have different sort of realities. Like it was just in the Into the Spider-Man, Into the Spider-Verse for the different kinds of, well, I shouldn't ruin the plot. Anyway, it's a good film. It also seems to be pretty popular amongst physicists, although I'm not such a huge fan of it because one of the problems is it breaks probability. <laughs> So imagine if you've got um, a particle that's in a 30% probability of being here and a 70% probability of being here. When it hits the detector, it splits into two universes where it definitely is, with 100% probability it's in one place and 100% probability it's in the other place. So if everything all happens, what do those original probabilities actually mean? This problem is addressed in an interpretation called the cosmological interpretation, which says that many worlds theory is trivially true if the universe is infinitely big, because there's an infinite number of you's doing that experiment. And those, that infinite number just splits in proportion. So 30% of those infinite you's will see one thing and 70% of those infinite you's will see the other thing. Unfortunately, there's no experiments that we can actually run to see if this interpretation is more valid than the Copenhagen interpretation. And that's actually a general feature of all of these interpretations, is that we can't pick them apart with any experiments. And so until we have experiments, it's all kind of like physics-y storytelling. Let's now look at another aspect of quantum physics that doesn't quite make sense to us, which is called non-locality, otherwise known as spooky action at a distance. And this can be summarized by the EPR experiment, which is where you take two particles, say electrons, and you entangle them together to have equal and opposite spins, say. And then you separate them by a very, very large distance. Because they are now inextricably linked, the wave function that describes them has to describe both particles. And what this means in reality is when you do a measurement on one of these particles it instantaneously influences the other one which can be you know billions of miles away and it does that instantaneously so it sort of feels like faster than light uh, action that's the action at a distance uh, which einstein was really creeped out by so non-locality means that one electron its properties are not local to its physical place. Its properties are dependent on something very, very far away. And this is an alien concept in physics, because if I throw a ball, the ball's position or velocity or color or anything physical to do with that ball, they're all localized to where that ball physically is. Whereas in quantum physics, you can have things that are non-local. And that seems weird to a physicist, because you're like, all physics is like this, except for this one bit here in quantum physics. So this has spawned other interpretations of quantum physics that try and explain away this one. And one of these is called hidden variable theories. So the idea in a hidden variable theory is that when you do this entanglement, there's some secret label which captures the actual state of these two particles. So it's like if I flip a coin, and I hold it in my hands, even though I don't know whether it's heads or tails, the coin actually is heads or tails when it's in my hand, and I just reveal it when I open up my hands. So that's kind of what these hidden variable theories are like. The particles are in a definite position, we just don't know what it is until we measure it. Now this interpretation was actually killed by an experiment called Bell's Theorem, I'm not going to go into the details of this because I don't have time, but basically the hidden variable theory and quantum physics predict different probabilities of you observing certain things under Bell's experiment. 
And when they did the experiment, they actually found the results match quantum physics and not hidden variable theories. So hidden variables are out. Now it's not completely game over for the hidden variable theories because Bell's theorem is built on some axioms, some things that you assume to be true. And one of these is locality. And so you can have a successful non-local hidden variable theory also known as Bohmian mechanics, also known as pilot wave theory. Now the idea in this interpretation is that the particles are always real, but they're kind of surfing about on an underlying wave. And so when you see the probability of particles appearing in different places, it's because they've been nudged in different directions by this underlying wave. But still, we can't see those waves. And the advantage of this is that it kind of returns quantum physics to a sort of determinism, which um, none of the other interpretations of quantum physics do. But the trouble, again, is there's no testable hypothesis. So there's no way of us doing an experiment to see if it's true. So another thread in the interpretations of quantum physics is to instead focus on the collapse of the wave function and try and make that bit make sense. So there are interpretations called alternative collapse theories that try and add some extra physics into that collapse, either explain why it happens or add some, like describe the dynamics of exactly how the wave function localizes. One idea called spontaneous collapse theory is that the wave function has got a probability of collapsing at any time, a bit like sort of radioactive decay. So for a small particle, there's a very low probability that its wave function collapses, maybe like once in a hundred million years. Whereas for big groups of particles together in like a football, there would be way more collapses because if any one of those collapses, it has a knock on effect to collapse the wave functions of all the others. And so there'd be maybe a hundred million collapses per second, which kind of goes some way to describe why the world we experience is all kind of solid and deterministic and the quantum realm isn't. So it describes kind of the boundary between those things. And the advantage of this interpretation is it's actually making a testable prediction. And so at some stage in the future, we could design an experiment that could maybe see if it's true or not. So, you know, it doesn't say that it's any more likely to be true than any of the others, but at least it's got a testable prediction, which as an experimental physicist, I like. So those were the main interpretations of quantum physics, but there's many, many more. I'm just gonna cover a few more here, uh, but this isn't a, an exhaustive list. Uh, also, word of warning, this is where I started to get really rather confused. So let's proceed with some amount of caution. First up is quantum Bayesianism, also known as cubism, which takes the ideas of um, Bayesian probability and applies it to quantum physics. So it's sort of like a informational theory of quantum physics. And the idea, as I understand it, is that when you get new information about a state, it updates the probabilities of the things that you will measure. The consistent histories, interpretation of quantum physics, apparently the mathematics is somewhat of a hybrid between hidden variable theories and spontaneous collapse theories. It includes spontaneous collapses of the wave function, but different aspects, not just position, can collapse. It also says that those collapses aren't physical events, um, but just a way of you picking through a history of that quantum object that makes sense, that's consistent. The next one's quantum Darwinism, which is where when the quantum system interacts with the environment, certain things are killed off. So interactions between particles and the environment are kind of like natural selection for the properties of that quantum object. Another interpretation is called the transactional interpretation, which in the actual mathematics of quantum physics, it allows solutions that travel backwards in time as well as forwards in time, but we normally just throw away the backwards in time ones because, you know, you don't travel backwards in time. But like, I don't know, maybe you can. So that's what the transactional interpretation, it keeps those and says that the properties that you have may be dependent on things that happen to you in the future. And this is attractive because it can actually get around Bell's theorem. Another one is called the relational interpretation, which doesn't focus on the properties of quantum objects, but everything's defined by the relations between them. 
So those are the main interpretations of quantum physics. There's a few others, but those are the main ones. I sometimes get asked, what is my favorite interpretation? And I don't really have one. My thoughts about this are, because there's so many different interpretations of quantum physics, it's kind of a sign that we might be missing something kind of fundamental. So maybe one way to attack this problem is to really go back to first principles and back to the fundamental assumptions of quantum physics. Because there's some interesting assumptions that were made, like when you have a wave function, which predicts probabilities of things happen, that was just a guess and it works really, really well, but there was no real reason for that other than nice guesswork. So yeah, quantum physics is going to... Well, that's the end. Thanks for sticking through all of that. I hope it was of interest. I think you've earned yourself a nice sit down and maybe even a biscuit. So thanks for watching, and thanks also to the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. I always get loads of comments asking me how I produce my videos and what software I use, and the truth is it's a combination of all the Adobe software, Illustrator, Photoshop, After Effects, and Premiere. And Skillshare is a fantastic website if you want to learn any of these programs for your own creative projects. As well as covering the Adobe software, they've got more than 18,000 classes covering everything from drawing, writing, through to film production. Their premium subscription service unlocks all of these lessons, which are delivered by trained professionals in their fields. But if you want to get a head start, you can get a two-month free trial for the first 500 people to click on this link. The link is also in the description below. Well, that's it from me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.